Let's talk about conservation of energy in collisions. Now, obviously, total energy is always conserved because even when you have energy loss due to friction, that's still conservation of total energy. Um, and when we classify collisions with the conservation of energy, usually you think that we classify them in terms of mechanical energy, but we actually only classify them based on kinetic energy conservation, which you can probably imagine as soon as you have friction, you definitely do not have kinetic energy conservation. So when there's no friction or anything like that or air resistance involved, that's what's called a elastic collision because your total kinetic energy will be conserved, meaning the energy, kinetic energy before the collision of the two or three or four or whatever objects will be the same as the kinetic energy after the collision, like obviously the total between the however many objects are uh, involved in the collision. So if this occurs when objects collide, but they're not permanently deformed. It doesn't generate any heat. So this does actually happen a lot at the atomic level uh, where the things are so small that they don't really generate heat or they don't, um, they're not subject to friction or anything like that. So there is such things as elastic collisions, but we don't see them a lot on a, a grander scale. Um, the only way we can really get elastic collisions uh, with out going to the t atomic level is usually using frictionless surfaces like an air table or something like that. And so obviously atomic level is usually where we see those. Inelastic collisions, of course, uh, are when kinetic energy is not conserved. So of course, when we think about collisions, we usually think of car collisions. And of course, those are definitely in inelastic. So you know that it's an inelastic collision when the objects are permanently deformed and total kinetic energy is not conserved. So if we look at the kinetic energy before and after, um, then it will not be the same. It will be less afterwards than it will be before. Um, just because your total energy is conserved, then your momentum is still conserved. So keep in mind that if friction is acting throughout the whole thing, then that's not an external force. So momentum is still conserved. So that's the good thing about momentum. We can still consider that conserved even if our energy or kinetic energy is not, okay? Because of course, we always know that total energy is conserved because energy is converted to things like thermal, potential energy, things like that. And a completely inelastic collision is when two objects stick together, right? So if you have like a lump of putty and you throw out another lump of putty uh, and they run into each other, they'll probably stick together and that would be a completely inelastic collision. There is collisions where two cars are, uh, collide and they do get stuck together. That's also a completely inelastic collision because as much energy as possible that could have been uh, transferred to heat has been transferred to heat. Okay, so that's a completely inelastic collision. So, of course, in an isolated system, we have conservation of everything. We have conservation of momentum and kinetic energy and total energy. In an inelastic collision, even if it's in an isolated system, we still don't have um, conservation of kinetic energy. We just have, have conservation of total mechanical energy in the isolated system, even in your inelastic collisions, okay? In your non-isolated system, uh, when in external forces can act, then we don't have conservation of anything. So as soon as we have external forces acting, the only thing we can really look at is our work energy theorem because that's when you do have a change in energy and need to uh, use work equaling change in energy to consider that, okay? So as soon as you have an isolated system where no external forces are acting, that's when we can use something like conservation of momentum, conservation of total energy, but maybe not conservation of kinetic energy. So our momentum, what would change that? If there's a net force exerted on the object by a, the other objects, so that's the change in momentum of a single thing. So again, consider whether a question reading, is it about the whole system or is it just about the one object? Because if two cars collide, of course, car one is going to have a change in momentum. Car two is definitely going to have a change in momentum. But if we're looking at both of them as a system, the total momentum, meaning the sum of momentum before and the sum of momentum of the two of them afterwards, should be conserved. 
okay? So always take a look at, okay, are we looking at an individual item or are we looking at a whole system, okay? Because those internal forces uh, in the system, if they're exerted between the objects in the system, that's still conservation of momentum because it's still part of the system, okay? And then the really, the internal forces are just like the action-reaction type thing due to Newton's third law. And so always ask yourself, Am I wondering about the whole system that's happening here? Or am I just looking at the change in momentum of one of the things interacting in the collision? Okay. Um, but most of the time, if it's giving you lots of information about both or three or whatever things in the system, uh, then you're looking at the whole system and conservation of momentum in that case. So um, if I need you to classify something as elastic or inelastic, it's not enough to just say, oh, there's probably friction, so it's probably inelastic. We actually need to calculate it. Always need mathematical con uh, confirmation. So uh, if I'm asking if a elastic, uh, or sorry, a collision is elastic or inelastic, then you have to figure out the kinetic energy before and after. If your change in kinetic energy, meaning final minus initial kinetic energy is zero, then of course it's an elastic collision because it was conserved. It's the same before and after. If your change in kinetic energy is less than zero, meaning there's less kinetic energy finally than there was initially, then of course it's an inelastic collision. So to classify something as inelastic or elastic, you actually need to find the change in kinetic energy. So you find the kinetic energy finally minus the initial kinetic energy. Uh, and then that also does mean like the change of everything's kinetic energy. So if you have two things colliding, then you need the to add together the final kinetic energies of the two separate things and subtract from that the initial kinetic energies of those two separate things, okay? And so always make sure if you're asked if something's uh, a collision is elastic or inelastic, you actually need to do calculations for that. You can't just say, oh, there's probably friction, so it's inelastic. No, actually figure out is it elastic or inelastic. So let's do an example and figure out if something's elastic or inelastic. So this is actually uh, referring to example A10 from two-dimensional momentum when we had the billiard balls uh, running into each other. So we already did a bunch of the work to figure out, I think, the final velocity of the green ball. So if uh, you want a refresher on that, you can go back to that, that video. That is example A11. Or sorry, A10. This is A11. And uh, then we're going to go on to figuring out if that collision was elastic. So just... As a refresher, we had a 0.75 kilogram white billiard ball, was traveling west at 13 meters per second, straight to say stationary green one. Uh, and so, of course, the kinetic energy before would be the kinetic energy of just the white ball because the green ball was not moving beforehand. And then the white ball has a final velocity of 4.5 meters per second at 38 degrees north of west, and then find the velocity of the green ball, which we did. Uh, why did I not give the direction there? Because kinetic energy is a scalar. So this is the great thing about uh, calculating kinetic energy. We do not have to break this into X and Y directions. Kinetic energy is a scalar. I don't care about the direction they're going at. So thank goodness we can just take their speeds because really one half mv squared is just the V there is speed, not velocity. So that is great news for us because that makes our life a lot easier. So if I'm looking at calculating the change in kinetic energy, of course, I want the final minus the initial. And of course, our final kinetic energy. So we have the um, energy of the green ball. So a one half mv squared. So of course that's the green ball plus the kinetic energy of the white ball. And this is of course afterwards. So we put the little tick things there to say that, oh, that's after. So I'm gonna find that kinetic energy. And then I'm gonna subtract from that the initial kinetic energy of so, which is of course the kinetic energy of the, the green ball plus the kinetic energy of the white ball. But that's, of course, initially. 
And keep in mind, the green ball was not moving initially, so that's actually zero, right? Because that velocity is zero, so the one-half m times zero would just be zero. Uh, but we have the speeds of the green and the white ball afterwards. We have the speed of the white ball beforehand, so we should be able to calculate this without a problem, okay? So one-half, the, the green ball had a mass of 0.8 kilograms, And remember, had a final speed of 9.2. I'm just going to put 9.24. Or actually, I'm just going to put 9.2. But obviously, I'm going to use this whole value here so I can get the most accurate value for my uh, answer. And then I'm just going to plug in the rest of the numbers there. When we calculate that, we get negative 22 joules. And so since that is a negative number, which it should be if it's inelastic, you should never get a positive number for change in kinetic energy because that means you've gained kinetic energy and then there is definitely external forces acting. So it should either be zero or negative. And if it's negative, of course, we know it's inelastic because that means it has lost kinetic energy. Okay? And so we know since change in kinetic energy is less than zero the collision is inelastic. And that's it. So much, much easier calculation than what we actually had to do to get the final velocity of the green ball, which of course can still definitely be part of one question where part A is to find the velocity of the green ball, which is a lot of work, and then figuring out if the collision is elastic or not, which is not as much work. So remember, as soon as we're dealing with energy, we don't have to consider direction, which just makes your life so much easier.